What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Duke Wisdom Podcast, where it looks like we finally have a team that looks like it's ready to hang banners. It's, it's been a work in progress this season, and it's no done deal. There's still time to go. There's still games to play. But I think I can confidently say this, this very well may have been Duke's best game of the entire season. And I know they played very well against Baylor. They've had very good games throughout the year. This isn't their most impressive win, but I think that this is the best the team has looked. This team today looked like a team that can win an Elite Eight game. I don't know if I've been able to say that until now, but this team, and I don't know what it is about John Shire. It's funny because it seems like, you know, Coach K was the Izzo killer, and now John Shire's got a little bit of Izzo in his DNA, maybe. He's... He, he's got teams that, that, that aren't their best self in November and December, but come late February, John Shire's teams turn a new leaf. They, they find themselves in a way that they had previously not been able to do. And that is exactly what we've seen here in the last, the last few games have been leading to it. I think last episode I said that I wasn't particularly impressed. And I think that still holds up. It's still true that I wasn't like completely like wow this team is his his turned a new leaf they look completely different they're so much better I wasn't convinced yet but the important thing is they were winning games and in basketball sometimes all it takes is winning some games and suddenly th- things start to click when winning really puts some some real pep in your step man so it's a real sense of urgency it is a sense of belief so much of sports so is confidence. When you know you have the talent, the skill, the athleticism, so much of it is just going out there and it's effort and confidence. And when you win, the more you win, the easier it is to have confidence. Plain and simple. And this team executed for so much of it. I mean, there were some mistakes and I'll talk about it. There's mistakes in every game. But they executed so well. Down, I mean, down the stretch, just efficient. The passing offensively was was amazing the ball movement uh inside out just knocking down threes it's exactly what this team can be Filipowski was mobile he was able to put the the ball on the floor but he was not forcing things he didn't do too much when he didn't need to he did enough to get jobs done and but he was aggressive he was confident he was good and you know just last episode I was talking about how let's let's tone down the the hate. Uh, well, I don't see a whole lot of hate right now in the Duke community. It's it's all admiration for all these guys. Just terrific effort from every player. Great game plan. A, a 29-point win was not what I thought was going to happen. And I, When I talked about this game last episode, I talked about it as being a trap game. That Basically, I thought Wake was the real trap, but this was the trap before the trap. This was the game that Duke if they weren't careful, could fall and lose this game, and that could derail everything, their, their hopes of an ACC regular season title. But they did not fall into that trap one bit. Not one bit. They excelled, and they were able to establish a large lead, keep it, and actually grow it in the second half, which is something that I don't know that we've really seen against a quality opponent and some people might say well this Miami team not so much of a quality opponent I don't know I disagree uh, and, and there's a few things on the Miami side that I guess they they obviously play into this one Duke had had dealt with an injury problem with the concussion to Tyrese Proctor the game prior he comes back for this game and he comes off the bench Proctor has a solid game I'll talk more about that so Duke fully healthy to the to the most extent um Miami, that's not the case. It was announced, I think, yesterday, maybe, that Nigel Pack wasn't going to play in this game, which Nigel Pack is a shot maker. Um, he's short, and he doesn't really help the defense for Miami, but he's a shot maker. There's no doubt about that, and that's something that Miami was severely lacking, was a guy that had the, that ability. I mean, it was Wuga Poplar versus the universe, and he still you know, wasn't able to do it, and I think was fighting some maybe small nagging injuries himself. Not only that uh, with with Pac, but Matthew Cleveland also out with illness. So that's basically taking away two of your top four players if you're Miami. 
Poplar a little gimpy at times. And then your best player, who's a first team all ACC candidate, nor Chad O'Meara, just rattled beyond belief by 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 Duke at first and then by himself. He was three of 14 from the floor. I mean, this is a guy that I don't know exactly what he shoots from the floor. I'm actually looking at 60 percent is what he shoots from the floor. Three of 14 from the floor. And I mean, all but one of those are just are in the paint, basically in the charge circle. He shot that one three that was just horribly off. Um, he ends with nine points, 10 rebounds, which, you know, on paper isn't a horrible game, but when he's a 17 point and 10 rebound averager, you know, he held his end of the bargain, uh, on the boards, but not so much scoring wise. Duke did a terrific job. And I think Kyle Filipowski did a terrific job of remaining vertical when defending him. Uh, there've been times in past games where, where I might get a little upset with Filipowski because He's getting the hand in the cookie jar with guys in the paint a little bit too frequently. You know, guy, there's no reason for that. If he just remained vertically seven foot, he's got the height and the length. Sometimes he's not going to block the shot. He's not Mark Williams. He's not Derek Lively. And that's fine. You know, just stay vertical, remain in, you know, and go lateral and just contest the shot. And he did a very good job of that. He did a very good job of defending without fouling uh, excessively. And I think that played a big role in how Norchet O'Meara's game started out. But it wasn't just him. It was Mark Mitchell as well, who's, who's a fantastic defender and did a very good job in the paint. And it's Ryan Young later in the game uh, doing a very good job, help side defense on O'Meara at times. He did very well uh, both on both sides of the ball. And it's funny, Ryan Young, I think, only scored four points in this game. And I'll get more into Ryan Young, though, uh, but had tremendous impact. But, you know, it was once Norchet O'Meara really got Going into this game and Duke had rattled him, it was all it was all him. I mean, there were shots that he normally would make, probably. That they were still tough, but he's a tough player. They would normally get those to go. But, you know, when you're when you're playing ball, man, when you get in your head like that, when you see chippers, when you can't hit layups, that's a different level of frustration as a basketball player. I know it. I mean, so some days. When I'm playing, it'll be like, you know, I can't hit threes and that's fine because then I'll just drive. I'll drive the lanes, get a rhythm going uh, at the rim. But if you can't get a rhythm at the rim and you're not a shooter, um, it's going to be a tough day. It's going to be a really tough day. And Miami was very dependent upon Norchad O'Meara for for some offense today and they just couldn't get it from him. Uh, they Joseph and Poplar are really the only two players that provided any offensive spark for Miami, Duke ends up holding them to 55 points. A very good, very good defensive effort. And I understand, I know, Miami had already lost four consecutive games coming into this one. They are sliding severely. But I think this game, let's just, look, not arguing that this game is the game that that resume-wise is putting Duke at a new level. Obviously, that's not really the case. But I think this game is extremely important because I think it is the best game Duke has played. And I also believe that winning a game like this against a decent team by 30 is something this team needed to do because I've talked about it time and time again. They've been playing with their food. They get up 10 or 12 and then they let it go, get back down to four, push it to seven. It's back to five. Now it's eight. Now it's four. But the other team never really goes away. Even though Duke wins the game, the other team never really went away. Miami was never really there after like the first, you know, 10 minutes of the game and Duke pulled into a little bit of a lead. Miami was never there for the rest of the game. They, they just vanished from this game and Duke kept the foot on the gas and they have fought every little issue that, that has come up with them that they have fought and got better at as this season has progressed. And that's all you can really ask for from these guys, man. And, And my question to everybody would be, yeah, this team struggled in November. This team struggled in December, struggled a bit in January. But and and it's like, well, they're falling so short of their expectations. This is such a talented team of the number two team preseason. It's like, well, would you rather remain the number two and be the number two team throughout November, December, and January? Would you rather enter the final four or en- <laughs> yeah, enter the final four in April? You know, because like so many Duke teams have been ranked in the top three for the entirety of the first three months, basically. 
but then they've suffered some losses in like February and fizzled out a bit and ended up being a first or second weekend team. And this team doesn't feel like that. I mean, I'm not saying they're not going to lose in the first or second weekend. Certainly they can. It, a lot of it will depend on how the bracket falls. But I'm saying that I now believe this team can be a third weekend team. I really do. And it doesn't matter if they look like a third weekend team in November, December, or January, or even the beginning of this month. They look like it now. And March is about a week away. So, man, a lot to get excited about from this one, man. Just uh, so much to be excited about. Want to join a community of Duke accounts publishing news, theories, and predictions on Duke athletics? Join the Duke Wisdom Network. Just go to dukewisdom.org slash join network today and fill out the form with your name and social media. Or you can DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. Become a part of the community of Duke fans publishing their takes today. Again, that's dukewisdom.org slash join network to DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. And I'll transition at this point. I, I've got some notes and, and I've got some some player breakdowns for the for the Duke guys. Uh, but but, you know, it's yeah, man. <laughs> so I guess I'll start off with with the notes that I've got. And. You know. First of all, this is the 29th straight win for Duke when leading at the half, which is kind of a crazy stat. So come postseason, hopefully Duke is leading at the half every single game. Uh, Some other notes I had. Defensive urgency was amazing. It really was. I mean, they were right there. And even times where Miami scored, they were just so disruptive. Their their rotations were amazing. Um, they, They had so much urgency. And then my next point, my next point, uh, Zion O uh, pointed out that he has be- basically he feels the same way when Jeremy Roach is shooting threes that he felt about Quinn Cook in 2015. And I mean, it almost feels like we're, we're, we're beating a dead bush here when it comes to the Roach-Quinn Cook comparisons, but it just feels so right, man. He's so, so efficient. He's just so efficient. And Jay Billis talked about his maturity as a player. There's just, I feel like there's just, I've done a poll about this on Twitter too, that he is easily the most trusted player on this team by fans. I think he's most trusted by the coaching staff. Uh, Everybody just, you can feel at ease when Jeremy Roach, he makes mistakes every once in a while. Every player does, but he's such a mature player. He's become so polished and he's just the definition of a senior captain capable of taking a team to the final four. And he's a 45% three point shooter. He was four of six today from three. And I think he's one of the best three-point shooters in the ACC. Statistically speaking, that's very much true. But it's just the feel and the confidence you have with Roach as a shooter. And I feel like it's not talked about enough. Uh, He's a far more consistent shooter from three than anybody else on Duke's roster. And that's Jared McCain included. Jeremy Roach is without a doubt the most consistent shooter on the team. And it's not particularly close. He today took home player of the game for the first time since those back-to-back losses against Arkansas and Georgia Tech, which is hard to believe because Roach has had such a good all-ACC season that he hasn't been player of the game since then. And this is his first player of the game game, uh, in a win. is kind of crazy. And honestly, today, I mean, statistically speaking, if you just look at the lines, I think there was a better case for Kyle to be the player of the game. But there was just something about the feel of Jeremy Roach in this one, and he did have the most points by just one over Kyle and Mark. But there's just something about his performance today. So Jeremy Roach took home player of the game. Um, speaking of Mitchell with 15, Mitchell was fantastic. He's Scotty, he's such an underrated player. I, I probably feel I probably sound like such a broken record when talking about Mark Mitchell, but he's just so underrated. He's finally at the point where he's just not scared to be assertive offensively. And he got eight points very quick in this game and was very important for establishing the tone for Duke. Because Miami, it was very clear that they had watched the last few games and Jim Laranega believed the key to throwing Duke off was to throw double and triple teams and just throw so much defensive attention at Filipowski uh, down low early on. And well, first of all, Filipowski did a good job of avoiding that and passing out of it before the defense even got to him. Most of the time you could see a double team coming and he would pass out of it before that even occurred. But they were so concerned about him, they almost forgot about the other all-conference uh, front court player Duke has and Mark Mitchell. Everybody forgets about Mark Mitchell, but he's uh, the silent assassin. 
you know, in conference play, about 15 and eight a game. He's been terrific. And again today, 15 points, five rebounds, five of seven from the floor. And it's amazing to me that nobody shot more than nine times for Duke. But almost ev- and everyone in the starting lineup and Proctor shot anywhere from seven to nine times, which is just, I mean, what a just what an even attack offensively. But Mitchell, another terrific game on both ends today. And then speak of the devil, I've talked about him a few times already. Kyle Filipowski, 15 points, six rebounds, four assists, three blocks, five of seven from the floor, two of three from three, three of four from the line, uh, just a single turnover. And, and we got to talk about that, that just beautiful spin cycle, that spin move into the around hook reverse dunk on the other side of the rim. Whoo, man, I leapt out of the, out of my seat when he did that. I was like, dang, you know, dude has been eating some flip chips, bro. They have been giving him superpowers. Those flip chips go crazy, man. I, I was, I was beautiful. I was beautiful. And what a great game. I'm, I'm, I'm amidst all the, the, the scrutiny and everything. He comes and he performs, but he doesn't, you know, and he doesn't try to overdo it. He, he does exactly what he needs to do in this game, and he was terrific. He really was, and I'm sure he'll have off games, um, for the in at some point for the rest of the year, regular season, ACC tournament, and NCAA tournament. It'll happen at some point, but I feel a lot more, a lot more confident at this point in the season that Duke can overcome a bad Filipowski game and still win because the rest of the team looks so good. But when Filipowski is firing, Duke is so good. And today wasn't even a day that he was dominant, dominant. He didn't need to be. But he was beautifully productive. Um, Jared McCain, honestly, you know, didn't follow that 35 with uh, an amazing game. He just had seven points, five rebounds. He was just three and nine from the floor, one of six from three. You know, not an amazing game overall, I think, from Jared McCain. Uh, he did. He does have a tendency to force drives sometimes, and I think especially today he had moments where he really wanted to get into the paint and get something going, but he would force it a little bit and turn the ball over. He did that in the second half against Florida State as well. So that's still an issue I think that he has, perhaps maybe his biggest issue. Uh, but he did show a different part of his game getting up there with that that dunk on the fast break. Man, another just kind of makes you want to jump out of your seat moment. That you know, I knew he had that in the bag, but seeing him pull it out was like, yeah, this guy can play in the NBA right now. And there's been a lot of, I think, internal debates over the last few days of what guard's going to come back. Uh, I'll get into this more probably later in the season. My my pick is Proctor at the moment to return. I think it, you know, it very well could be any of the three of them. My pick is not McCain at the moment. The reason for that is I believe Jared McCain can play in the NBA right now. He's a first round pick, and I can see him competing in the NBA well right now. I think give Proctor one more year. He's truly ready. It's not going to hurt his draft stock to come back. Uh, that's just my my immediate take on that. But uh, looking, Caleb Foster got the start again, and he had a double digit game, eleven points for Foster. Very good, three of five from three. He'd been struggling to shoot a little bit from outside coming into the day, but a a really good three point performance from Foster. Just a really good, good double digit game. You know, every starter except McCain scored in double figures. Uh, I've already talked about Roach. Let's uh, Sean Stewart had some good active plays off the bench and he had seven rebounds he got two points there toward the very end of the game uh so a solid performance from sean uh tj power comes in at the end not able to hit the one through he gets up he's pretty much been taken out of the rotation i feel like for the rest of the season uh we'll see what he can do sophomore year uh neil Neil begovich comes in and gets his first two points as a blue devil he hits a pair of free throws uh, a heck of a cross up by spencer hubbard man didn't have spencer hubbard playing today on my bingo card but he sure did I didn't think they were walking into Coral Gables and uh, Spencer Hubbard was playing. If you'd told me that, I would have been like, damn, they lost by like 40. But <laughs> Spencer uh, Spencer comes into the game, does well. Um, and so the the, the uh, Jalen Blakes doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, but the two guys to really talk about on the bench are one, Tyrese Proctor in his return from a concussion. Ends up with 12 points and five assists with just one turnover. Very solid game, very good game from Tyrese Proctor. Uh, I like that he he was tied for most shot attempts on the team. He wasn't like amazingly efficient, but he was still good. He was great. You know, thirty three percent from three isn't bad at all. Almost fifty percent, a little bit under fifty percent from the floor. Uh, but overall, a very good game, especially in his his game back after the concussion. Ryan Young, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, just four points, but man, nine 
rebounds, three of those being offensive boards, keeping possessions alive, just a workhorse, defensively putting in work and just keeping possessions alive uh, on the boards, ends up getting a couple of assists as well. Just smart basketball, heads up plays from uh, Ryan Young, doing the gritty things that the help teams win. Uh, Sean Stewart did very similar things, some very gritty heads up plays from from Stewart, getting down, diving on loose balls, tying it up. Uh, very impressive from from both of those those bigs off the bench. Uh, you know, Sean, get those hands right, sophomore year, and 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 he'll be good. But this game was just remarkably impressive for Duke. And and it was a heck of a, a a turn for them, and I think this can be a huge turning point for Duke. Five straight wins. I I, I hold on to my point that I kind of believe that Duke might lose Saturday, even after this game. Now this game makes me think that maybe they won't. But 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 big you know asterisk here. Wake just beat the snot out of a Pittsburgh team that looked pretty good. That. Pitt had beat Virginia. They had gotten onto the NCAA tournament bubble. Like Lenardi had them on the next four out. And then they just get smacked by 33 uh, against Wake. And they had a frustrating loss to Virginia the game before that. They just lost to Duke literally a little bit over a week ago. Uh, so it's going to have been not even two weeks since they played each other. Wake needs this win. If Wake doesn't win this game, I don't know if Wake can make the tournament. Outside of a terrific showing in the ACC tournament. Wake needs this win desperately to make the tournament. Uh, Duke, Duke, as I've said, I think in the last episode, uh, now that they got this win on Miami, I mean, it's not like Duke's schedule is easy for, for the rest of the year. Um, no doubt it's not. But I really do feel like even if they lose to Wake Forest, if they beat Carolina in the last game of the season, at least a tie in the regular season looks pretty like like that's a pretty good uh a, a chance of that happening because you know i mean carolina even if carolina runs the table you beat them you can lose to wake it's fine now if carolina loses to somebody else as long as you beat carolina you can lose twice <laughs> to to wake and uh, like maybe virginia or state um now obviously the goal is to win these last five games and end the regular season on a 10 game winning streak that's easier said than done there's some tough games in here carolina at wake Virginia, Virginia needs wins uh, at state. That's never an easy game for Duke. And that's that's four games that aren't easy. And, and heck, don't look past Louisville and Cameron. That needs to be a 30 point win. But. You know, in these, I don't know, I just don't know. I think if Duke beats Wake Forest on Saturday, they're looking awfully good to win the regular season. Like if I, I firmly believe in them in terms of beating Carolina and Cameron. So. Uh, to me, it's like if they pull that game out at Wake Forest, it doesn't matter if it's pretty or not. If they can win, all they got to do is like win one out of two of Virginia and State. If they're going to beat Carolina, all they have to do is beat win one of those two. They don't even have to win, have to win both of them. So this is a, a big game for Duke because it, it can provide a lot of comfort and a lot of cushioning for them in pursuit of that regular season title and that one seed in the ACC tournament. You know, obviously that Carolina wins, no guarantee. And even if they lost that game, I suppose if Duke wins the next four games, Carolina loses to somebody else. Well, you know, they have the same record. Carolina obviously gets the one seed, but, you know, it's something. So an important game, but one that that I'm not. I don't know. It's interesting. I think it's maybe the most interesting game left on Duke's schedule in terms of, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. You know, a few days ago, you'd ask me, I said Wake was definitely winning that game. I still feel like Wake might win that game, but I feel a lot better about Duke. <laughs> Duke's chances after this Miami game, they look great. And let's just see if they can follow it up with another great performance. It's been a fun night uh, watching some Duke basketball tonight and talking Duke basketball. I thank you guys, as always, for for tuning in and listening. This is a little bit shorter of an episode compared to the the normal ones, but just one game to talk about. Last episode, I had four. But thank you guys for listening, as always. Make sure to subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you listen. And follow Duke Wisdom on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks so much for listening, guys, and I'll talk to you later.